The more you understand about commonly used probability distributions, the more flexibility you will have for building realistic simulation models. At Risk has a great tool for exploring probability distributions. It's Define Distributions tool. You can easily see the shapes of distributions. You can see their parameters and how they affect the distributions. You can calculate probabilities or percentiles. And you can even capture pictures of these distributions to paste into Excel, Word, PowerPoint, or other documents. All of this is very easy, as I will demonstrate in this video. For practice, I will start with a blank workbook. Then I will select any cell and click Define Distributions on the At Risk ribbon. This opens the dialog box you see here with a number of tabs. Each tab leads to a gallery of distributions. As you can see, blue icons represent continuous distributions and red icons represent discrete distributions. When you select a distribution's icon, you see a question mark. If you click this, you get a lot of technical help on the distribution. Although this help is great for reference, you will probably be more interested in exploring a particular distribution interactively. To do so, select its icon and click the Select Distribution button. I will do this for the normal distribution. This opens the interactive window you see here. On the left, you see the distribution's parameters, in this case, the mean mu and standard deviation sigma. You can change these to any values you like, such as 110. And the chart of the distribution changes automatically. If the parameter values are stored in cells of the worksheet, you can enter references to them with this button. If you would rather show a different distribution altogether, you can click the button to its left or you can click the function drop down above it. To the right, you see many summary statistics of the distribution. The mean, the standard deviation, the median, a lot of percentiles, and others. There are several viewing options in the Statistics drop-down. You might prefer one of these for reports. On the chart itself, you see two vertical lines, or sliders, with numbers above them. You can use these to find probabilities or percentiles of the distribution. For example, to find the probability that a random value is less than 85, you can enter 85 above the left slider. And you see that the probability is 6.7%. To find the probability that a random value is greater than 113, you can enter 113 above the right slider. and you see that the probability is 9.7%. You can also drag the sliders, but then it is more difficult to get the exact value you want. Percentiles are just as easy. Of course, many percentiles are listed in the right pane. But if the percentile you want is not in the list, such as 7.5 percentile, just enter 7.5% in the box to the left of the left slider. and you see that the corresponding percentile is 85.6. In the same way, if you enter 15% to the right, you see that the 85th percentile is 110.36. If you are of the older generation who had to perform probability and percentile calculations with bulky tables, you will really appreciate this interactive capability.
At the top of the window, you see the at-risk function that can be used to simulate a value from this distribution, in this case, the risk normal function. In fact, if you click OK at this point, this function will be entered in the selected cell. Then if you click Define Distributions again, with this cell selected, the distribution you defined will appear. At the bottom of the window, you see a number of handy buttons for changing the chart and performing other useful tasks. You can hold the mouse over any of them for a brief description. Help, displaying graph options such as the title of the graph, exporting the graph, for example, to a PowerPoint, change the type of the displayed graph, overlaying another distribution on this graph, changing the distribution, zooming in or out, showing or hiding the function argument panel, and if you happen to have an at-risk library in SQL Server, you could add this input distribution to it. For example, if you want a cumulative ascending chart instead of a density function, you can get it from the fourth button from the left. As another example, if you want a picture of the chart that can be pasted into a document, you can right-click the third button from the left and select one of the options. Here I will select Copy Graph and then paste it into the worksheet. The copy is no longer interactive, but it can be useful for reports in Word, PowerPoint, or other documents. You can learn a lot about distributions very quickly with this Define Distributions tool. For example, you might have heard that the gamma distribution is a useful distribution for uncertain quantities that must be positive. To learn more about the gamma distribution, you can open it and start exploring. In particular, you see that it has two parameters labeled alpha and beta. But these are not the mean and standard deviation. To see how these parameters affect the shape of the distribution, you can try varying them. As you will see fairly quickly, alpha determines the shape and beta determines the scale. Specifically, the gamma distribution is always skewed to the right, with more skewness for small values of alpha and less skewness for large values of alpha. The parameter beta doesn't change the shape at all. It simply rescales the horizontal axis. In fact, you might realize fairly quickly that the mean of the distribution is alpha times beta. You can also explore discrete distributions, such as the binomial distribution. The only tricky feature here is interpretations of probabilities based on the slider positions. For example, the binomial distribution you see here represents the number of heads in 10 flips of a fair coin. If I position the left slider at 3, what does the 17.2% represent? the probability of less than three heads, or the probability of less than or equal to three heads. It turns out that it is the latter, as you could learn from online help. However, an easy way to see this is to move the slider to a non-integer value just to the left of three. Now the probability changes to 5.5%, so the original probability must have included the probability of three, as well as two, one, and zero. Similarly, with the right slider positioned at 8, it turns out that the corresponding probability, 1.1%, does not include the probability of 8, 
as you can see by moving the slider slightly to the right. In this case, the probability doesn't change, so it must not have included 8. By the way, you might notice that when you first open the binomial distribution, it will show the values 2 and 8 with 5% in each tail. This is the default behavior with the Define Distributions tool, but it can be misleading for discrete distributions because there might not be any integer values with exactly 5% probability to the left or right of them. If I enter the values 2 and 8, the probabilities change to 5.5% and 1.1% respectively, as you see here. Again, this means that the probability of 0, 1, or 2 heads is 5.5%, and the probability of 9 or 10 heads is 1.1%. Hopefully this video has persuaded you to use at risks Define Distributions tool every chance you get. There is no easier or more helpful way to learn about probability distributions. At Risk has many built-in features for Monte Carlo simulation, but arguably its most useful overall feature is its ability to store values in designated output cells as the simulation runs and then report them in various graphical and tabular ways later on. To make this work, you have to designate cells you want At Risk to keep track of as output cells. You have probably already done this, or you have learned how to do it in the At Risk Quick Start videos. The current video will expand on some of the possibilities. The model shown here, which is based on one of the at-risk example files, illustrates some possibilities. The random values in the cells with green font and the Excel formula logic in rows 20 to 23 lead to the net present value, or NPV, in cell C26. This is the output you probably want at-risk to keep track of. To designate it as an at-risk output cell, you select this cell and click the Add Output button on the at-risk ribbon. This brings up the following dialog box where you can provide a name for the output that will appear in at-risk charts and reports. If the suggested name is suitable, you can simply click OK. Then the formula in cell C26 changes to include the risk output function with no arguments. Alternatively, if you change the name in the dialog box, the risk output will have one argument, the name you specify. Another alternative is to specify a cell with a label that has the name you want then the address of this cell becomes the argument of the risk output function. The advantage here is that you can change the label at a later time if you like. Now the argument is cell B26, this label. As one last alternative, you can click the FX button in the Add Output dialog box. This allows you to specify more properties, such as the units. In this case, the risk output function includes corresponding property functions, such as risk units, as extra arguments. Property functions are described in more detail in the Property Functions video in the Guided Tour series. You can designate as many at-risk output cells as you like, and at-risk will keep track of each of them during the simulation. However, you are not limited to single cell outputs. You can designate an entire range of related output cells, often a time series. For example, you can select the range of sales prices in row 21 and click the Add Output button. The resulting dialog box is slightly different from the dialog for a single cell. Now the name at the top is a name, which you can change, for the entire range. 
Actually, the italic indicates that this name is a label in an adjacent cell, in this case the label in cell B21. Once you click OK, each cell in the sales price range has its own risk output function. For example, the risk output function for the sales price in year 3 is shown here. It turns out that the risk output function reserves its second and third arguments for situations like this. The second argument specifies the name of the output range, in this case the label in cell B21, and the third argument specifies the position of this cell in the range, the third cell. The advantage of specifying a range of output cells is that it is quicker than specifying each cell individually. Besides, they can all share the same name. Then when you run the simulation, you can request a summary chart of the entire range. This button, summary chart, and I will get the entire range of sales prices. Here it shows the time series behavior of the sales price. If you decide you don't want a cell to be designated as an at-risk output cell, there are several ways to remove it from the list. First, you can manually delete the risk output function from its formula. Now it's not a risk output cell. I'll undo that. Second, you can click the Add Output button and then click Remove. I will add that one again so I can remove it another way. Third, you can click the Model Window button to see a list of all at-risk outputs. Then you can right-click any one of them and select Delete. To remove any output range from the list, you can right-click the name of the range and then select Delete. You might or might not have ever used At Risk's model window. If you haven't used it, you might start using it once you view this short video. The model window is At Risk's way of documenting the inputs and outputs in your model. The model shown here, adapted from one of the At Risk example files, can be used to illustrate the model window. It finds the return of a portfolio of stocks in two ways, under an assumption of independent stock returns and under an assumption of correlated stock returns. This model is already documented to some extent, with green font used for uncertain inputs and maroon font used for at-risk outputs. Also, the correlation matrix stands out clearly with at-risk's own color coding. However, not all at-risk models are laid out this clearly, and you might need some help discovering where the inputs and outputs of the model are. This is where the model window comes in handy. When you click the model window button on the at-risk ribbon, the following window appears. It has three tabs for inputs, outputs, and correlations, with the inputs tab shown by default. You can scroll down this list to see all 10 input distributions. If you right-click any input, you see the following menu. This allows you to blow up a graph, rearrange inputs, send a report of an input to Excel, and some other options. Many of these options are available from the group of small buttons at the bottom of the window. Note that the delete option simply replaces the input distribution by its static value, usually its mean. It doesn't delete the contents of the input cell entirely. You might take advantage of these options, but your primary goal is probably just to see a list of the model inputs. 
The Outputs tab shows a list of all at-risk outputs. In this case, the first two are output ranges of the independent and correlated stock prices, and the last two are the portfolio returns. Again, you can right-click any of the outputs to get the menu of possible actions shown here. In this case, the Delete option simply removes the output from the list of outputs. That is, it deletes the Risk Output function from the cell's formula. Finally, Correlations tab lists all distribution functions, if any, that include the Risk Cormat function. By right-clicking any item in this list, you get a menu of actions that is virtually the same as the menu for inputs. Again, the main purpose of the model window is for documentation. If you open an at-risk model from a colleague, you can go directly to the model window to get a quick understanding of the model, the input distributions the person is using, the outputs the person is keeping track of, and any possible correlations.